What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another video on my channel. My name is Josh Fan of ShowMeFootball.com, covering your Missouri Tigers. And today I am joined by, as always, Braden Dowers. And we've got some awesome Mizzou news to talk about today. We're going to kind of catch up a little bit since it's been a while since we made a video, talk about recruiting, talk about the NFL draft and the Tigers that we could see get their names called next weekend. But the biggest news of today, Brayden, and the biggest reason why we're here is because the University of Missouri and its board of curators finally announced a highly anticipated $250 million stadium renovation plan for Faroe Field. They're investing $250 million in the north end zone. We're going to show you guys those renderings, and then Brayden and I are going to kind of give our opinions, but... Guys, the, these are the renovations right here, and that is from the contracting group that the university is using for their new stadium. This is going to be in the north end zone, and I mean, I don't know what else to say, but this is just absolutely beautiful. You can see it from the outside there, too. The different premium seating options that are going to be available now, the suites, and then, of course, I, you know, my first thought when I saw this was, I'm so glad that they were able to preserve the Rock M Hill while also adding an end zone bunker club because I didn't think both of those things were possible. And it's really better than anything I could have imagined. Um, I mean, I don't know, Brad, what are your initial thoughts on the Mizzou Stadium renderings uh, for the new Faro field and those should be completed prior to the 2026 season. I believe I saw Gabe Diarman of power Mizzou put out a tweet before we got the rendering saying that it would be $250 million. And when I saw that, I'm like, Whoa, like that, the South end zone was a hundred million dollars and that was a pretty big deal in itself. So I expected something significant, but you know, we got brain, we kind of got like those fake renderings a while back that kind of looked legit. And it wasn't AI because like AI can't even spell Mizzou without messing up. Like those were legit and they like came out of nowhere. So I don't know where those came from. We'll probably never know the full story of why those existed, but this is even better than those were. And I would have been happy if it looked anything close to what we got in those fake renderings, but I'm just absolutely blown away by what they were able to come up with here. Yeah. Stay on this picture for a bit because I mean, that just really shows you what Faroe Field and Memorial Stadium is going to look like at the start of the 2026 season, which really isn't that far away. I'm really excited because the stadium being so open for so long has really dampened the sound of that stadium because just being in the student section, being in the lower parts of it, it can get loud. Now that the entire stadium is going to be enclosed, that place is going to be a nightmare for opposing teams to play. And they said that we are going to be able to get uh, capacity up to around 65,000, which is back to where it was whenever we had just general seating in the uh, south end zone. Yes. Which is great. Um, I really don't know if there's too many renovations that they're going to be able to do after this. But I mean, just look at like it's just a complete new wall. It's it's beautiful. Like it I love just it. looks great if it looks anything like that. Uh go back to the first picture of it because there, there's one little tidbit of it. Yeah, I, I love the scoreboard. The scoreboard is fantastic. They picked an absolutely amazing play um to showcase <laughs> on that scoreboard. And what you were saying about the rock M is true as well. Uh it obviously was shortened up a bit but i'm very glad that they kept that because that is a massive part of mizzou's tradition uh, it's like they're like a very big part of their identity is that rock m and i'm really glad that they are able to preserve that and it all it just fits it just looks good in uh the context of that picture like if that if that is nearly identical and that's what it looks like then it's going to be amazing like I, I'm, I i'm very excited for this i mean it encloses the stadium which is what i've been asking for for years like i'm a stadium junkie first of all so like i feel like i even have 
more of an appreciation for this than most people. But, you know, this is better than anything I could have imagined once again. And, and I just love that we're getting that enclosed stadium. I'm going to go back to this picture. And, like, this, it looks like a real SEC stadium, which is something that a lot of other fan bases still would always kind of poke fun at us for is, hey, our stadium isn't exactly up to par uh, to some of these other stadiums. And I would say this renovation, you combine that with the South end zone renovation they did a few years ago. This puts us in the upper half of SEC football stadiums once this gets done. And I saw some, I put that out on Twitter and I saw some other fans of other teams say, oh, no, it doesn't. You're still a crappy little state just like Arkansas fans, but like they were all going to say that. This a hundred percent makes us better than Fayetteville. Yeah, it already was better than Fayetteville. I mean, at least we can fill our stadium. Dump. At least we can fill this stadium. But I I just love it. And one of the biggest complaints that I always heard people say after we got that South End Zone done was it kind of doesn't fit with the rest of the stadium. The rest of the stadium is kind of older looking. And then you have like this new futuristic looking part of the stadium. Now with the North end zone renovations that we're going to get, you finally get that continuity. You get a sense of uh, consistency throughout the stadium because you have the East and the West side, which I think go together pretty well. And then you have the North and the South, which I think match pretty well. Yeah. And so and you got the scoreboard that's kind of similar. It's just going to be a little bit bigger, I think, it looks like, on the other side. And then it's going to be a little bit higher because um, they have made this to be a little bit higher than the other side. But I love it. And it, it's going to be so – I mean, imagine how loud it's going to be when that place yeah. is packed out. You know, I'm so excited for that. And it looks like they got – so many you still get have a lot, a lot of general seating right but you also have the suites you have the premium seating options that are going to be in high demand and then um it looks like they're even going to have some areas for maybe like the families of recruits to kind of attend the game or important people uh and it's nice to just offer that option um i just i love this i love this idea i just I'm mind blown, honestly. Like it's going to be so exciting once this is done. And I love the Rock M, and I love the North End Zone, and I did kind of like the open air concept and kind of you know we're not counting capacity on that side, but you could pack you know hundreds, maybe a few thousand on that hill um, for games. But it was time to enclose that stadium. It was time to kind of give us that bowl effect around the stadium. It's just beautiful looking. I mean, I don't know what else there is to say. I love the outside too. Like the outside of the stadium, just modern looks nice. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be one of those games that opposing sec fans are going to want to make the trip to Columbia to see, you know, I mean, that's going to be a stadium that people are going to want to see now. Granted after all of this, Braden, I know I said that it'll be in the upper half of SEC stadiums. It's not going to be, it's never going to be Bryant Denny Stadium. It's never going to be LSU Stadium. It's never going to be Georgia Stadium. But this is a step in the right direction. And, you know, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but all the talk since DRF has left the university as the athletic director has been like, oh, wait, what's going on? Do we have the right leadership at the university? And, you know, conversations can be had about the board of curators and whether or not they kind of overstep their boundaries um, in decisions like these. But I don't know how you can hate on this, Braden. I mean, the BOC did a hell of a I, job putting this thing together. Yeah. I wasn't uh, available whenever you made your video on DRF. So I haven't really made any big comments on her leaving. I was initially pissed. Um, I hated the board of curators, Robin, mm -hmm. Uh, who was one of the main people behind this project. Um, I mean, she was getting lots of hate, some from me. Like, I was not happy with her because DRF built a relationship with fans that was so good, and she was just a great ambassador for Missouri. And it seemed like... A great it, face and figure for the entire university. It seemed and, like everyone was pulling in the right direction, finally. Yeah. It felt like once she got here, a lot of things started moving in the right direction. Whether now looking at 
everything and knowing a few more things that we know now, maybe she really wasn't the person behind all of this because Dennis ended up going 0-19. That hire is looking a lot more shaky than it initially did after the first season, even though Mizzou's recruiting class has been pretty solid for basketball. Um, but DRF as a name in Mizzou, Moon Choi came out with a comment today saying like, no, Arizona's still going to have to buy her out. Like we're not just going to let her go uh, for free. So that's, that's another, um, showing that like th this university, it was not just DRF. It was not her. And there was some sort of power struggle between her and drink. And if that's kind of what the rumor is. Yeah. Like that, that, that's what the rumor was. So if you tell me like drink or DRF, I'm picking drink every day of the week because like if you get in a power struggle with you know, the head football coach that just won an 11 and two and won a new year six bowl, um, you're not going to win. Like I, I, I don't care who you are. Football trumps all like you're, you're, you're never going to be able to beat that. Yeah. And there was also some rumblings that maybe DRF was a little too focused on the non-revenue sports, whereas other leadership of the university wanted to put more money into football. Yeah, this kind of backs up that sentiment because I mean, two hundred fifty million dollars is insane for a college. Like that's that's none of that's public funding. That is all donations and mm -hmm. uh, what just money from the university. Has. Yeah, but if you remember, Braden, before we got these renderings and before we even had rumblings of renovations at Memorial Stadium, there was supposed to be that master facilities plan where it was all facilities across athletics, right? Mm -hmm. And then DRF got fired like two weeks after that. Or not fired. Well, fired, stepped down, whatever happened. We don't know what happened, but... Um, they they established the that ways. oversight commission of the athletic department, and then she just mm -hmm. passed, basically. Yeah, but there was also that master facilities plan, and then it just kind of became football, which again backs up the sentiment that DRF was not thinking the same as everyone else as far as investment into football and investment behind Eli Drinkwitz. And that's the other element that I want to talk about with these stadium renovations is that this university could not be more committed to Eli Drinkwitz and the football program. Mm -hmm. uh, people have kind of started to say, hey, if Drink has another good year next year, makes the college football playoff, you know, he could leave for another university. He could leave for another big time job if one were to open. But Mizzou is giving Drinkwitz absolutely everything he's asked for. The yeah. indoor practice facility last year when that got built finally. These new north end zone stadium renovations. The NIL. We have heard time and time again. We've also seen the results of NIL at the University of Missouri. It's one of the best in the country. And the recruiting has been great for Eli Drinkwitz thus far. Why would he feel the need to go everywhere or anywhere else? Because those other places, the advantage, the allure to go into those places has kind of been dampened a little bit by the fact that other schools can now pay players. Other schools are trying to step up their game and Mizzou finally starting to act like an sec school. They're starting to play with the big boys with the stadium renovations, with the NIL investments, um, this is just another sign that this school is committed to Eli Drinkwitz fully and they will give him whatever the hell he wants. And I'm all for it. Yeah. Like I'm really excited to see what the football team does next year. Like me and my dad got season tickets because there was so much buzz around this team, around this university, around what they can do. And the commitment of the school behind Drinkwitz is extremely reassuring of their confidence in him. Um, I, I, the main reason why I don't see him really ever leaving is because you're getting every single thing that you want is a, uh, Home states, Arkansas. He picked Mizzou over Arkansas initially. Mm -hmm. He's never going to go to Fayetteville. Um, so that's never going to be a concern. Um, Bama has DeBoer now. He's going to be there for a while. Kirby's never leaving Georgia. Um, Ryan Day, maybe he goes to Ohio State, but 
I mean, we drink. Um, I don't see him going to Michigan anytime soon. Or I, I, I just couldn't see him going to Michigan either. Um, like th there, there's no major schools. There's no major players that I feel like are really going to be in a need of a coach anytime soon that are bigger than Missouri or at least on the same level. And I don't think that drink would ever just uproot what he's built here already to go someplace and just start brand new all over again. Well, one of the schools that like Mizzou fans always had an eye on after drink took the job here was Auburn. What if drink does really well here in the Auburn job opens up? Could drink leave for Auburn? You know, he was a part of Gus Malzahn's national yeah. championship staff there. He has ties to that school, but a couple years ago, sure. I can understand that now with NIL and with, you know, again, the stadium renovations, what does Auburn have that we can't offer drink with? It's the legacy. It's, it's just sure. a legacy factor. I think. And the legacy factor is what, well, real quick, championship or make the playoffs and go far in the playoffs here. I think at that point, it's like, that, like, like it's proof that you can build anything that you want to here. Like the resources at Auburn aren't necessarily going to be that, that much better at this point. Um, but at that point, it's really just the legacy school and like, Oh, I'm coaching Auburn. Sure. Um, but well, my counter building Mizzou up to the point and he makes the playoffs next year and we win playoff games, then Mizzou becomes like M Mizzou's becoming a very hot commodity. Like that is, it is becoming a place that coaches are going to want to go to, even if drink some, for some reason leaves in the next decade. Well, and my counter to the whole legacy thing would be, we've seen a lot of programs now who thought they could go after the big fish, like even take um, Kentucky and basketball most recently. After Calipari left for Arkansas, Kentucky was they like that they were getting a uh, Hurley from UConn. Yeah. And they oh, offered, no. and they, and they supposedly offered him a lot of money to leave UConn. He said, no, uh, someone else that was on their list was Nate Oates at Alabama. Alabama is not historically the basketball no, school that Kentucky basketball. is. And Oates was like, no, I, yeah. like what I got going here. Yeah. Because these schools can now offer resources that trump any sort of legacy because coach because like before the legacy is what kept these yeah, schools recruiting at such a high level that that's how they were able to get like high level kids like i had this argument with connor all the time about like alabama football because he thinks i'm trying to dunk on saban no i like i love saban like nick saban is a legendary coach but the facts are the facts nil and the portal are part of the reason as to what led to his decision to retire because before schools like Alabama could stack blue chip recruits and no, and nobody else was able to get them. But now those kids, because Saban was able to sell them on, this is Bama. You're going to practice against the best every day. You're going to come in here. You're going to earn your spot. You're going to be second or third on the depth chart for your first two years. Now kids are being offered money and playing time at other places to where they don't feel like they need to sit on the depth chart at places like Alabama. And I mean, so the parity in college football because of NIL, I think is becoming very good. Like Georgia's still clearly number one and the big dogs are still the big dogs, but like th th there's so much more competition and ability for schools to compete now. And there's been talks of that 70 team uh, super conference, whatever the hell they're talking about. And Mizzou supposedly going to be in like the same division as Ohio state, Michigan, Purdue, and all these other schools. And it like that, that I think is eventually like in my lifetime where college football is going to be headed where the sec, the big 10, the big 12, they won't exist. I think that that is eventually the reality of the situation but I don't see Mizzou getting grouped in the same conferences with those um, schools. No, I think it'll be a little bit before we get anything like that. And I feel like there will also be a lot of influence from the bigger schools on what conferences or what divisions would look like. I think yeah. each team is going to be able to kind of put in their word on that. I wanted to read this quote real quick though, that, 
Gabe from Power Mizzou put on Twitter. This was from curator Bob Blitz. He said the project, when it was conceptual before it was finally approved to this day, was a smaller project. Let me just put it that way. And then uh, Gabe followed up in the tweet. That's a reference to what was originally discussed in November under the previous AD. Again, so under back- DRF, we are going to do significantly less for football. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Which I think so, you know, people are starting to kind of get the full story now of what exactly happened there, right? Yeah. Um, didn't want to focus on football. Board of curators did. They told her dip. She dipped. Well, and I, I mean, like, I think she was focused on football, but it was less of a less of a backing up drink wits was the real problem. Yeah. And wanting to get give that money to a coach that she didn't necessarily believe in. Yeah, it um, wasn't her guy because yeah. Stern fired drink. And the board of curators had drinks back. Drink had the board. And look, you can't go up against the BOC and drink and win that battle, as you said earlier. Uh, Gabe did also provide some tidbits earlier about the AD search since Mizzou still doesn't have an athletic director right now. And uh, I can't find the quote, but it was something to the effect of You know, the position, a lot of people want to come be the AD of an SEC school. We have a lot of candidates that we're sifting through right now. I don't know how much I buy that just because it does kind of feel like candidates maybe aren't as interested in the Mizzou job because of what happened with DRF. Like, look, when an athletic director at an SEC school takes a step down to go to Arizona, something's not right. Um, But, you know, then again, when we see the AD, it's definitely a like it's a proxy position like Mm -hmm. you're you're kind of a puppet Um, and i i mean look things are going fine without an ad right now so you know people were pissed when drf left and look i get it because like i thought she did a lot of good things for the university but you know i think we're kind of starting to see the reason as to why she left and maybe it wasn't such a bad thing so, all in all, incredible day for the university and the future of the football program, but we're going to get into some other stuff. I, we'll we'll talk about the draft first, and then we'll kind of get into football recruiting because the draft is next weekend. We expect to see quite a few Mizzou guys go off the board. How? So, I'll just ask you, Braden, okay. how many first-round picks – do we see come from a zoo and do you think there's not going to be any at all? Cause I know we had an ongoing yeah. debate about that. I mean, me and you have gone back and forth multiple times on if Darius Robinson is a first round pick, he's got invited to the green room. There's a decent shot that he does get drafted in the first round, but I think that he grades that more of as more as a defensive tackle and teams aren't really going to look at him as an edge rusher that much. Um, And there's a lot of defensive tackles above him. And there's a lot less teams that really need defensive line in this draft. So in my opinion, with the way that the draft boards are shaking out, like I don't see Robinson getting drafted in the first round. If he does, it'll be in the mid to late twenties. I still think that he'll go early to mid second round. And I think that's about his talent level. I think he's about a mid second round pick. Um, Somebody that I'm interested to see is Ennis. I can- so I just saw this like literally right before we started recording. This was from Matt Miller, who is a draft analyst for ESPN. Yeah. Uh, he said, after talking to teams this week, it sounds like Missouri cornerback Ennis Rakeshaw could go earlier than some expected after yeah. he was limited in the pre-draft process, which I think we kind of knew that like yeah. there were talks of him coming out of fall camp that he was like the fastest guy on the team. Like, low four fours, high four threes. And then he ran like a four, five, six at the combine. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't much better at pro day. And, and then we heard about the groin thing, which checks out because he had a groin injury uh, that kept him out of the bowl game in the end of the season. That said though, I think the concern is less about Rake Straw's athleticism and more about his health now, because yeah. this has been going on a while and he's had quite a few injuries throughout his collegiate career. So I have no doubt, actually, in my mind that Ennis Rakestraw is a first-round talent. It's just the health that scares me for him. Yeah. Um, 
but he he seemed like the first round guy that we had early on in the draft process. Now he's kind of fallen to like consensus day two pick, maybe day three. Um, but mm, maybe he he's starting to create. Or, or not day three. I'm sorry. Third round is what I meant to say. Not day three. Um, but who? it sounds like maybe he might be creeping back up into the first round. We'll see. I, I would be more surprised if... Okay, I, I don't know if I'd say that I'd be more surprised if Robinson went over Rankstraw, but I think that Rankstraw is definitely more of a first-round talent and personally to me like if i'm an nfl team and i'm an nfl gm and i have no corners and i have no defensive ends on my roster and i got one pick in the first round and i know that i can pick ennis or darius i'm picking ennis Hmm. um I, i i would set the over under at half and i would probably hit the over i bet that one of them does get drafted in the first round um, both of them would definitely get drafted in the second round. But overall, just off the top of my head, um, Ennis is getting drafted. Darius is getting drafted. Chris is getting drafted. Hopper should get drafted. Um, Foster, there's five. Um, there, there's a few other guys. I think Carniles, he might have a shot at going. Or Carly's. Carly's, yes. Um, Carnile's still on roster. Carly's Carnile. Um, Carly's could definitely go late five, six, seven, day three pick. Um, but besides that, there, there's probably about six or seven names that I was get sh- called. I was trying to find the graphic. I can't Cody find Schrader it. Too. Yeah, there's a chance he gets picked. I, I was trying to find the graphic. I, could, I can't find it about i think we were tied eighth for most projected picks in this year's draft yeah. with six um so that would have to be d rob ennis kad javon foster tyron hopper i would think and then who am i missing i feel like i'm missing a big one maybe not but there's the possibility of cody uh carly's carly's is underrated to me like i feel like he's not getting enough draft type because he is a like he he wasn't the greatest player at Mizzou, but I feel like teams are going to fall in love with his potential transitioning to linebacker as a dime linebacker at the NFL level because he's a 225 pound safety that runs a four five, and yeah. he's a juiced up athlete. I feel like there's a team that's definitely going to look at him like mid to late. He has, he has the athletic build and the mold. Um, to become something that can be mm-hmm. pretty valuable to just about every team in dime packages. He might surprise people. I- I'm excited for his potential. I want to see what ha- I'm going to be most interested to see if he goes in this draft. Cause I feel like in a few years, he might be one of those guys that ends up being like the best Mizzou player from this class and nobody saw coming. I think that's possible, but I really like Ennis's potential if he stays healthy. KAD too. I mean, he yeah, feels like a safe Chris, pick. Chris he, feels like well. a, I, he feels like a guy I, that's going to be a... like Chris more than I liked Ennis, um, but not not as like NFL prospects. Mm-hmm. Just what they are able to produce at Mizzou. I think Chris did a little bit more. Yeah, he feels like a safe pick for a team. Just a guy that's going to be a real good slot corner for a long time, and he's going to get several NFL contracts. Darius Robinson, I didn't kind of follow up too much on him myself, but I would love for him to land with the Chiefs at the end of the first round. And I know that's like kind of a running gag among Mizzou and Chiefs fans is like, we always want a Mizzou player at the end of the first round or whatever. But like genuinely, Darius Robinson would fit exactly into what we need because we're going to be without Charles Amenehu for the first probably quarter of next year. Um, and we desperately need help at defensive tackle. Darius Robinson kind of kills two birds with one stone, and that's his best hope for being a first-round draft pick is that he's kind of a hybrid, can play inside and out. And he's he's an elite athlete for a defensive tackle. He's less of an athlete if you're projecting him at edge, but I don't think any team is going to necessarily project him at a specific spot. I feel like the Detroit Lions, with the draft being in Detroit, with D-Rod being a Detroit kid, if he's there at the Lions pick, I could see Dan Campbell like run into the podium with a card with his name on it. 
I I could see something along those lines. Like he he seems like a guy that the Lions would fall in love with. Um, so I wouldn't be too surprised if they pick him at what is it? Pick twenty nine. Think twenty eight. Okay, twenty pick twenty eight. I want to say. Uh, late first round. I can see him going there. That's probably the biggest um, potential of him getting drafted. But again, I think that he's more of a mid second round talent. But I also thought that Jack Campbell was a mid second round talent and he went at pick number 18. Um, and I think everybody had a general consensus that uh, J- uh, Jameer Gibbs was a mid to late second round pick as well. He went at number 12 to Detroit. So they've had no problem overdrafting guys in the past. Um, I, I, I think that some Mizzou guy sneaks into the back end of the first round one way or the other. Yeah, I agree. Who's the, uh, how do I say this? Who do you think is the most polarizing Mizzou prospect in this draft for one reason or another? I mean, between me and you, it's Robinson. Um, Okay. Well, okay. I should rephrase. Who's like, who's the player that like you have the hardest time projecting where they're going to go? Cody. I can really? see Cody going as early as round four and get in as late as being on. Really? Really? I would be ecstatic if he got drafted in round four. My like I like there's been so much like buzz around him just as a person and what he's able to do. And yeah, his uh Raw's score was terrible. And like we we knew that, that was gonna be the yeah. case. Like, he's not that athletic of a player. But I feel like there might just be like some team that just falls in love with him um, and drafts him super early. Um, I I think that he's projected to go round six or seven. So, again, I could see some team just overdrafting the shit out of him. I could also see him just getting completely left behind and go undrafted and sign with the Chiefs in training camp. Oh, he's 100% going to be a Chiefs UDFA if he goes undrafted. Yeah, like 100%. Thousand, like if he, if he is a UDFA, he, he is a Chief. Yeah. Um, Cody, yeah, not a great athlete. However, his saving grace was that 4 6 40 yard dash. Mm-hmm. And people are going to hear that and they're going to go, what? That's not even that good. But it's not bad. Like you can work with a 4 6. Yeah. Like K- Kareem Hunt ran a four, six, 40 yard dash. There's a lot of good running backs that don't run blazing 40 yard dashes. What you didn't want for Cody was for him to run like a four, seven, four, eight as a running back. That would have been bad. You can't be. So like I was listening to a podcast the other night and they were kind of talking about running back prospects and the way they look at them is running backs either need size or athleticism. You can have one and be really good. You can have both and be awesome but it's really hard to have neither size or athleticism and be good. Yeah. Cody doesn't have great athleticism. He doesn't have great size, but he does have a trait that he can lean on and it's his burst when he finds the hole. And Which it's is that-, often that. So I was doing a deep dive. I think I mentioned this in the group chat before, but nobody really said anything. Um, I was doing a deep dive on a bunch of college stats and advanced stats. Cody Schrader is the best running back at picking the hole, uh, picking the right hole. Like he made the right re- he's one of the smartest players on the football field um every single time because when he's choosing a gap in zone runs or he's just a regular gap run, he makes the right read and makes the right call. It was like 85% of the time whereas the next closest guy was like 72. Like blew everybody out of the water um that's that's what i really think like he's the smartest running back on the football field yep and that's why he absolutely has a chance to make it in the nfl but his speed his speed he's deceptively fast like again the 40 time it's not gonna jump off the page but you watch him play and he's got good burst he's got decent he's speed. Clyde. he is i've always said it if ceh can be on an nfl roster and Cody Schrader absolutely deserves yeah. a shot in the NFL. But the guy that I was kind of getting to with that question about like who like who do you have the toughest time projecting? I, I was meaning to say Tyron Hopper. I have no idea what his stock yeah. looks like because 
He's a good he, linebacker. He's kind of forgotten about completely because I remember he was like early, early in the season at the end of last year, it was projected he would go round two, round three. And now it's – Who knows? Yeah. He could be anywhere from a second or third round pick to like a sixth round pick, it feels yeah. like. It just depends on how – bad teams need linebackers which for the most part is pretty bad well and it's interesting with him because he was really good um not this past year i mean he was still good last year but the year before was when he really kind of had his breakout year in college last year was a little bit of a step back i felt like maybe he had an injury going on or something that we didn't know about because he didn't seem to be able to turn his hips the same but he seems to be an ideal modern NFL linebacker with coverage ability, but he did little to no pre-draft testing, and there's just been very little buzz around his name at all when it comes to Mizzou prospects. Like I've just heard very little about him, and I have no idea yeah. what his stock looks like. Like there, there's there's been conversations around everybody, and I've seen tweets about literally every single Mizzou prospect besides Hopper. Um, so yeah, like that that that's a good point. So I think he's probably a round five guy. Um I think he's just gonna kind of be forgotten about and just stuffed behind a bunch of other linebackers on the depth chart and probably won't ever really amount to too much. I hope he does, but just with the pre draft process and where he's probably gonna end up, I it's going to be hard for him to find a real shot to start and be a difference maker in the NFL. I have still pretty high hopes for him that he'll be on some teams three deep and play a little bit. I know in those Seahawks mocks we've been putting out, I always see Tyron Hopper yeah. sneak, sneak in there somewhere because God knows y'all need linebacker help still. Yes. But, um, yeah, man, I, I think he'll get drafted for sure, though. I just have no idea where he's going to get drafted because his stock is just kind of all over the place. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit of Mizzou recruiting um, because something that happened since the last time we talked was Mizzou earned its first 2025 commit in Penn, or Pennsylvania QB Matt Zollers. He chose the Tigers over Georgia, over Penn State, over Pittsburgh. He also made a late last minute visit to Alabama. I don't know if they ever ended up offering or not, but in the end he chose Mizzou and that was a very significant recruiting win because that was one that really just kind of established Drinkwitz and established Mizzou, like P like other programs and other like, um, people around those programs and like podcasts that I saw were like, holy shit, we got to start taking Mizzou seriously. They're like to pull the number one player out of the state of Pennsylvania like that. Yeah. That's just unprecedented for us. Like, yeah, we have good NIL and that definitely was a factor, but we've had good NIL, you know, for a lot of guys. And in the end, it only seemed us to get us the local prospects. Like it was only most appealing to guys like Luther Burden, Williams, and area because they're the home state guys. You can market that a little bit better. But to really, truly go and get a guy out of Pennsylvania that is the number two quarterback now, I think, on on three. Yeah. He's a number two quarterback in the nation. Has the potential to start as a freshman, in my opinion. He was wanted by Georgia. He's one. He was wanted by Penn State. But their NIL, their NIL offers couldn't compete with us. And uh, Mizzou, it feels like, offered kind of the most attractive situation for him because we have a loaded receiver room. Um, it's Kirby Moore's offense. Like the buzz coming from that recruitment was that was all Kirby Moore. Like Kirby Moore did a fantastic job recruiting him. He was the coach that offered him. And he has the chance to start as a freshman. So what are your thoughts on the Matt Zollers commitment and how big of a win that was? It's a really big win as long as he stays here. Um, because I mean, there's a lot of time before national signing day next year. I would expect him to stay. Who knows if he will or not. I, but I'd expect him to, you mentioned how big of a role Kirby Moore played in that. If the offense does really well again this year, Kirby Moore's probably going to be gone as a head coach somewhere else. Um, so maybe he decommits and follows Kirby Moore wherever he goes. 
Uh, you mentioned that we have a loaded wide receiver room. We're going to be losing Luther, Mookie, and Weiss next year, mm-hmm. which we're still going to have a loaded wide receiver room without them. But I'm not like it's going to be a lot less proven talent because Luther, Mookie, and Weiss are going into year two together um, as the top three trio. Uh, I mean, we still have Marquise Johnson. We still have. Uh, uh, James, we're, we're getting James Madison. There's a bunch of wide receivers on this roster that are really, really good. Um, so it's not like we're going to be lacking a wide receiver next year, but it's definitely going to be a lot bigger of a question mark than it is this year. Like if you're asking me right now, what are the two biggest surefire positions on the roster wide receiver quarterback? Like we know we have insanely good wide receivers. We know we have an insanely good quarterback. Um, and with Zoller coming in, he's maybe going to have to compete with Sam Horn. Maybe not because Sam Horn had to get turned on his. Surgery. Yeah. Um, who knows if he'll be ready? Who knows if he's really going to be focusing on football? Who knows what the case is with Sam Horn anymore? Um, so Zoller could definitely come in as a potential. I mean, he could get upgraded to a five star recruit. And I think, yeah, I think there's a very good chance he's a five star by the end of the process. Um, so if, he becomes a five-star. He is the number two, number one quarterback in the uh, 2025 class. That's going to be massive for Mizzou. Uh, like Mizzou pulling the best quarterback one or the best or the second best quarterback in the entire country out of Pennsylvania to come in and start as a true freshman. That's going to be a massive story in 2025. <coughs> <Damn>. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I think he will sign with the University of Missouri. I just have a hard time seeing him backing out that commitment. He's already recruiting a bunch of other guys in this class. Um, You mentioned how Luther, Mookie, and Weiss will be gone after next year, and those are going to be some big shoes to fill. But, man, we have so much talent. And, like, you know, I always look at our receiver room, and everyone's always hyping it up. And I always forget about a couple of guys because of how much talent we have. It's like Josh Manning. There's a chance next year he takes a massive step forward. He burned his red shirt as a freshman. And then like, I always sometimes find myself forgetting about Marquise Johnson. He was a stud as a freshman. Mm -hmm. He'll probably take a big step. And then maybe we're looking at him as a guy that's like, Oh yeah, next year he's going to be like a thousand yard receiver. Like we got Marquise Johnson, but then you look at uh, some of the receivers we're in on in this class. So we were considered the favorite for Dylan Alfred before he went to Ole Miss and then Isaiah Mosey, we were kind of recruiting, but he committed to Oregon yesterday. Um, That one always kind of seemed a little bit less like Oklahoma. (laughs) Yeah. Oklahoma thought they had him locked up and they're making fun of us for not getting him. But that one kind of seemed to be a little bit less likely after uh, Jamar Mosey stepped down as the head coach at, um, Oh gosh, why am I forgetting the name of the school? LSN. That one seemed a little bit less likely. But then Javen Boggs, the four-star Ohio State commit, decommitted from Ohio State, and now Mizzou appears to maybe be trending for him. And then Mizzou also recently got a future cast prediction on rivals for Mizzou, and he's the four-star from CBC. I feel like if you can land... Massive. Yeah, and I feel... Mizzou hasn't been able to recruit there whatsoever. That's true. Now, if you get one or two of those guys, I'm perfectly fine with that. And then I would kind of like to leave a spot open for a transfer portal wide receiver because that I was as soon as you talked about like Luther Burden not being there and like not having the proven commodity, I immediately thought of that because I would like to leave a spot open potentially for a portal wide receiver and maybe go and grab one of the top guys out of the portal so that we can keep this thing going after next year. So Mizzou is looking at a lot of top talent. Like even right now, there's a lot of other opposing fans that are making fun of us for only having one commit. And we're like at the bottom of the SEC right now, guys, we did this last year and then we ended up with a top 25 class. And here's the thing. The reason why we're off to such a slow start is because we're in on a lot more highly rated rated guys that have options and they're going to be able to drag out the process more. But, uh, Gabe of Power Mizzou just put in a future cast yesterday for us to land four-star linebacker Dante McClellan out of Ohio. 
and he's supposed to be committing next week. So that would be yeah. a, another four star in this class. And then Mizzou also got another future cast for Lamont Rogers, the four star offensive lineman. Uh, I think he's from Texas. Yeah. Mesquite, Texas. I mean, we're just in on so many guys and I feel like this has the potential to be the highest ranked class we've ever had a potential top 10, top 15 class. That would be nice. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've never been the biggest guy into recruiting and into star rankings because Ennis, Chris, Darius, Nick Bolton, a bunch of like Mizzou has produced so many guys uh, that have become stars from just being three stars to Nick Bolton was a two star coming out of Texas. Like um, we've been able to produce and develop so many guys um, that aren't highly touted prospects. And that's been a really cool thing to see the, like that, that, that just produces a lot of really cool stories for the university. So it's nice to be in on a bunch of these really big high school names, but the same time we haven't seen them play college ball. It's a whole different game. Um, like you, you're having a guy from Pennsylvania just come down to Missouri. Like you, you're asking a 18 year old, 19 year old to come down from Pennsylvania, move halfway across the country and play in a bunch of stadiums of people of over 75,000 people. Like that's what he's going to have to be dealing with as a true freshman in the SEC. That's not an easy situation for anybody. I don't care if you're the number one or number two quarterback in the country. Like, I have I have breaking news, actually, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but I was going to get to portal recruiting next because the spring transfer portal window just opened. But um, I just got breaking news. Hayes Fawcett tweeted this out. Breaking Houston DL, Hakeem, and I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing this. Uh, he Wait, is this the Houston defensive tackle that was the Yes, there? yes. And remember, wow. Brian Early – our current defensive yeah, yeah, line yeah. coach was is now at he, he was the defensive line coach at Houston. Is our D line coach, and he just entered the transfer portal. That feels like one to watch for Mizzou fans. Okay. And I was just going to bring up another defensive tackle, Dominic Williams, a TCU defensive lineman that uh, entered yesterday. Uh, Hayes Foss had already tweeted that he's planning visits. Missouri is one of them, although he doesn't have a visit date set with Mizzou which kind of makes it feel like we're at the bottom of the totem pole there for him. But that would be a nice addition if we can get him on campus. Um, but he's visiting Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, and LSU before coming here. So that feels a little tough. Usually with portal guys, they commit on one of those visits. But the Houston guy that just entered? Um, yeah, that would be one to watch for Mizzou fans. I've um, I was gonna mention like how I've been a little bit skeptical of our defense going into next year. The more that I think about it, the more I'm like, mm. like I think that we definitely have the offense to compete with just about anybody in college football. Oh yeah, offense uh, is set. I have like zero concerns about the offense. Yeah, the defense is definitely a little concerning. Like I still really like a bunch of the names that we have there, and I trust a lot of guys to step up. Um, that didn't get too much playing time last year. I, I've pounded the table for Tristan Newsom. I'm really excited about him. Uh, I'm excited to see what Corey Flack can do. We're obviously getting Williams in the way. Right? Christian Williams is pretty good. Um, the Michigan State guy, Zion Young, that's his name, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, Zion Young, he has the potential to be a really big name on the defensive line. It's just um, – Burks safety. He was really good in the limited playing time that he got last year. So, I mean, there are definitely names. It's just being concerned how this defense is going to mesh and bond together with a new defensive coordinator and like four or five guys going in the draft. Like you're losing a lot of star production. I still think we need a defensive back. I would like to add at least one more proven defensive back, whether it's a corner or a safety. I don't really care. I feel like we got pride. I forgot about him. Yeah, but it's Pride and then it's Drayden Norwood. Norwood. And I like Good. Norwood a lot. I like him a lot. However, I don't want to thrust him into a role that he's not meant for because he's been very good as a reserve cornerback for us the past couple mm -hmm. years. I would maybe try to see if you can bring in an upgrade and have him kind of still be 
your second or third guy kind of, uh, and then him and pride can kind of battle it out for the other starting spot or something like that. Or you could bring in another safety. I really like um, Burks as well. Charleston's back for one more year. Who's solid um defensive line i would still like to see them add a defensive tackle we just kind of talked about defensive tackle i still think we need one at least one that McClellan provides from florida mm-hmm. but i would like to add a little bit more pass rush i really like what we have i think johnny walker is going to take a big step forgot we um, still have him get williams when coming in next year of course uh you still got christian williams who's really good on the inside but i would like to add one more guy and then maybe they add a running back. I've kind of seen a few guys that there's been some buzz about. I think we're fine with yeah. Marcus Carroll and Nate Noel, but can never rule out anything, I suppose. <sighs> Exciting times, though. Very. Especially if we get that Houston guy. Yeah, I really want him next. I, I just saw that in, as soon as we started talking transfer portal recruiting and – uh that, that seems like one to keep an eye on. Brian Early on line one. So I think we can go ahead and wrap it up there. We've been going for almost an hour now. I feel like we've covered just about everything from Memorial Stadium renovations to the NFL draft and transfer portal recruiting, recruiting in general. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up there, but this offseason is going by pretty fast. We'll probably do an episode not too long from now, assuming we get some big spring transfer portal commitments, because if we do, I definitely want to talk about them. I know we've had kind of a break in the offseason here where we didn't do content for a while, but guys, make sure you like, share, and subscribe so more Mizzou fans can find this. Uh, make sure you check out more of my work on showmefootball.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Show me FB and then Braden do. I even need to say it. Show me movies. Uh, if you're still watching 52 minutes into this, go watch me and Josh's movie reviews. Yeah. Um, put, put Putting out videos once or twice a week over there. Um, still re- having a lot of fun doing that. So yeah, if you, if you li- like listening to us talk for 52 minutes, there's <laughs> a few three to 10 minute videos over there. Of, I've started of I've started to contribute a little bit more yeah. now so you, you'll see my face on that channel a bit but yeah anyways that'll be in the description as always so you guys can go and subscribe but we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up there thank you all for joining us and we will see you in the next one M-I-Z. Z-O-U.